2 Corinthians and um, chapter 8, I'd like to um, pick up again on the idea and the concept of generosity. And of course, um, anytime we approach the idea of giving and generosity, for those of us that follow Jesus and worship Jesus, it's imperative for us to recall again that um, we are generous because our God is so generous. They call this the giving season. They call this the season of giving and caring, and this is the time you're supposed to open doors for people. This is the time you're supposed to give to charity. But I actually believe that is every time and every season, that we're going to be a generous community. So I'd like to lean into this passage again. In fact, last week we looked at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. This week I'd like to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Chapter 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians are probably, in fact, I think it's uh, almost unanimously agreed upon, they are the two most formidable, um, powerful, uh, clear, and um, how should I say, action-packed section of scripture on the subject of generosity, giving, and money. And so it's um, anytime you kind of want to get the heart behind not only Jesus, but of course the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. If you want to get the heart of our God on the subject of money and giving, you go to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and you're going to pick up on it real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In fact, I'm going to read this in the message. Can I read this in the message, guys? Do you have, oh wow, so fast. Can we just be thankful for our sound, audio, video, PowerPoint? I mean, even in the Christmas season, you guys are on it, man. I tell you, I'm sending you guys all turtlenecks. Second Corinthians, chapter eight. Can, um, can we start with verse, verse one? Is that okay? Do we have verse one up there? If not, I'll read it in the, in the ESV. Um, is that Casey? Hey, Casey, how are you? Her handle on Instagram is Casey, baby. Okay, 2 Corinthians <laughs> chapter 8, verse 1. Now, friends, I, I want to report on the surprising and generous ways in which God is working in the churches in Macedonia province. Fierce troubles came down on the people of those churches, pushing them to the very limit. The trial exposed their true colors. They were incredibly happy. Though desperately poor, the pressure triggered something totally unexpected. Totally unexpected. An outpouring of pure and generous gifts. I was there. I saw it for myself, Paul says. They gave offerings of whatever they could. In fact, far more than they could afford. Pleading, listen to this, pleading for the privilege of helping out in the relief of poor Christians. This was totally spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and caught us completely off guard. What explains it, what explains it, was that they had first given themselves unreservedly to God and to us. The other giving, the other giving, that's my title this morning, the other giving, the other giving simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their lives. That's what prompted us to ask Titus to bring the relief offering to your attention so that what was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in so many things. You trust God, you're articulate, you're insightful, you're passionate, you love us. Now, do your best in this too. I'm not trying to order you around against your will, but by bringing in the Macedonians' enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love, I'm hoping to bring the best out of you. You are familiar with the generosity of our master, Jesus Christ. Rich as he was, he gave it all away for us. In one stroke, he became poor and we became rich. So here's what I think. The best thing you can do right now is to finish what you started last year. Again, these Corinthians had prepared to give to poor Christians in Jerusalem who were persecuted and scattered abroad. They had heard about their trials and tribulations, and they had determined a year before to send a gift, to send an offering. They just haven't sent it yet, and so Paul is referring to that. He says, so the best thing you can do now is to finish what you started last year and not let those good intentions grow stale. Your heart's been in the right place all along. You've got what it takes to finish it up, so go to it. Once the commitment is clear, you can do what you can, not what you can't. The heart regulates the hands. This isn't so others can take it easy while you sweat it out. 
No, you're shoulder to shoulder watching them all the way. Your surplus matching their deficit, their surplus matching your deficit. In the end, you come out even. As it is written, nothing left over to the one with the most, nothing lacking to the one with the least. We'll stop our reading right there. Again, I want to title this message this morning, The Other Giving, The Other Giving. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you so much for um, this season. It's extraordinary as we get to celebrate um, your arrival on earth, which declares our freedom and our forgiveness and our new life. We thank you for that. God, we pray in the moments we share now in this room and in this building that you would do something that is supernatural, that you would meet us right where we are. Lord, there are so many challenges and obstacles represented in this room, and you know every single one. I pray you would meet us right now. In our challenges and difficulties, I thank you, Lord, when we are weak, you are strong and your power rests upon us. And I thank you, Lord, that you love the Seahawks and you're going to help us beat the Rams today. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Please, please, please. In Jesus' name, and everyone said. I don't know what I believe about begging, but that just happened. I, uh, I'm so grateful for the um, waste management garbage industry. I want to say that before I get into my introductory story here this morning. I am very grateful. I mean, what would life be if we didn't have someone um, or a company who would pick up our garbage? But Wednesday mornings is absolutely excruciating at our house. It's excruciating, and I blame the garbage company. We have three garbage cans. And I don't know why this is, but those three garbage cans apparently have to be serviced by approximately seven garbage trucks. It is so loud. It literally feels like a lawnmower is being uh, taken through our bed. Uh, and it starts at 6.15 on Wednesday mornings, 6.15. Like if you stayed over at our house, you'd have to count the cost if it was a Tuesday night. It is I mean, it is so loud, it is so obnoxious, it is so intrusive, it is so overwhelming. There's been times we have thrown pillows, just like, why? You're just like, it is incredibly loud. So loud, this last Wednesday morning, I just got up, it was about 6.30, I got up and I just stood outside, I just looked through the window and I'm just like, what, what in fact is going on out there, right? I just, I just wanted to watch like, I, I'm convinced, right, there's just people out there trying to make noise. I thought I was being pranked. I thought it's a joke. Like, it is a real, real thing. And I'm getting, like, fired up, right? It's like 6.30 in the morning. I'm like, God! You know, it's like crying out. Chelsea's like, go back to bed. I'm like, you submit. You know, and, and come on, guys, relax. It's a joke. Um, it is so overwhelming. The amount of noise. You think I'm exaggerating. You really do. I can, I can see it on your face. But I'm not. Like, it is, it's, it's absolutely over the top. And, and any friends of mine that have stayed at the house can tell you it is, it's so true. It literally feels like Armageddon, the book of Revelation is being played out. Like, it, it has begun. The dragon has been released with multiple heads. Like, it is, it's, it, it's so overwhelming. And maybe it's the thin walls and it's not a newer home, so maybe that's part of the problem. I don't know. But as I was kind of getting worked up and complaining about the, 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 the garbage trucks, the, the, the fleet of garbage trucks that service just three cans, okay, just three cans, um, I started to recognize, well, you know, I guess, what's the alternative? And I think I was in London, I think it was London at one point, and the garbage um, uh, companies had, had gone on strike. And if you've ever been to London, um, garbage needs to be picked up like every three minutes, or that place piles up, right? Gotham City will be overwhelmed, right? And, and it was just garbage everywhere. And London just smelled. I love London, don't get me wrong, but it just, it was smelly. And you're like, wow, we should really be appreciative. And that's what hit me the other morning. I was like, well, it is loud. It is intrusive. It is overwhelming. It feels like the book of Revelation is coming to pass for sure. But, but what's the alternative, right? Like we just kind of, don't deal with the garbage, it piles up. That's probably actually a worse problem. So I'm gonna turn my complaining in 
to gratefulness. And every morning at 6.15, when Armageddon begins, right, I'm just going to begin to thank God for the, I don't know if I'm going to do that all the time, but I'm going to begin to thank God for the garbage company. Now, when the subject of money comes up in church, sometimes it can feel intrusive. Sometimes it can feel like a fleet of garbage trucks are running through your nice, regularly scheduled church program. And you're like, hey, come on, man. Like, I I came to hear about Jesus, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his glory, his goodness, his grace, his mercy. I didn't come here so you could talk to me about my money. I, I, it's, it, in fact, Judah, it feels a little bit wonky. It feels a little bit clunky. I feel a little bit like you're kind of running some garbage trucks through my cul-de-sac here. I'd like to just, I'd prefer, but wait a minute, what's the alternative? Is not money one of the most dominant aspects of our human experience? Is it not something that's always on our mind. If it's not on your mind, if you're married, it's on your spouse's mind. And the fact that it's not on your mind drives your spouse nuts. You never think about budget because I have faith, honey. No, you don't have faith. You just don't do math. (laughs) That might be a little part of my real life, but that's not important. That was based on a true story, that section of the sermon. So money is a very considerable part of our life, and God is so good, he cares about that. So if this sermon at any point kind of feels a little clunky, a little wonky, feels like you got three cans and there's like seven trucks, and you're like, what's going on? Remember the alternative. Are we going to stay mute on one of the most uh, dominant areas of our life? Are we going to avoid money and sex and subjects that are really considerable in our life because they make us kind of feel uncomfortable. I love God because what really matters in our life, he speaks to in his divine book. He is faithful to address these areas of our life because you know what? God has a plan for sex. God has a plan for money. God has a plan for these real areas of our life. What's extraordinary to me and any uh, scholar or or, uh, studier of Scripture will tell you that when interpreting the Bible or approaching Scripture to kind of understand it, there's one of the simple rules is the amount of time that God gives to a particular subject, we ought to give to a particular subject. It's actually basic, I know, very basic. But if the Bible spends uh, an extraordinary amount of time on grace... We ought to spend an extraordinary amount of time on grace. If the Bible spends a lot of time on forgiveness, we ought to spend a lot of time on forgiveness. Now, in our portion of Scripture today, Paul has written a letter. It's his second letter now to the church at Corinth. A little bit of backstory, a little bit of background, context. Paul actually had a great relationship with this church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, he had planted this church. He had great relationship. Now, between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, Paul now, his uh, relationship is starting to break down. Some people have run through the church in Corinth and said mean things and bad things and hurtful things about Paul. And so now the people in Corinth are starting to go, well, maybe Paul isn't a good guy. Maybe Paul just wants our money. Maybe Paul's just out for himself. Maybe Pastor Paul is not who we thought he was. And so in those times, you know, you couldn't like post a tweet to like correct the error. You had to write a proper letter and it took time to get there. So by the time 2 Corinthians arrives at the church at Corinth, a lot of unrest has settled in on them and over them about the Apostle Paul. They're starting to go, we don't really like this guy. People are starting to believe these guest speakers that have kind of run through the church saying bad things about Paul. 2 Corinthians is a letter where Paul is trying to restore his relationship. He's trying to reiterate his care and concern for the Corinthians. Now, that's interesting because if we had a breakdown in relationship, right, if Leon and I weren't on good terms, probably, probably, most likely, I would not bring up the subject of money at my first go around. I wouldn't be like, Leon, it's good to see you. Yeah, well, it's good to see you too. Hey, you got any extra cash? (laughs) That probably is not the best approach. And yet, 
In his letter, Paul's letter to restore relationship, now it wasn't the first chapter, he's much more wise and shrewd than that, but in his 13 chapters, he dedicates two entire chapters on the subject of money. Think about that. 13 chapters, chapters 8 and 9, give us the most considerable portion of Scripture in the New Testament on the subject of money, and it's in the context of Paul restoring relationship. It is that important, church. It's that important that he, Paul even risked relationship to speak to the Corinthians about their resource and money. Now, he's, he's shrewd and he's smart and he's wise and, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He starts off 2 Corinthians chapter 8 not with an ask, not with a request. He doesn't say, hey, we could really use some money here in the churches that I'm planning. He says, have you heard the story of the Macedonians. Have you heard? What does he start with? He starts with a testimony. He says, have you heard of these guys? It is extraordinary what's happening. He says, the Macedonians, which would have been three major churches that Paul would have planted and probably some a multiplicity of rural churches that kind of uh, broke off from these churches and were out in the fields and the hills, but three major churches that Paul had planted in the Macedonian area and the provinces. And he says, have you heard about these churches? They heard about the persecution in Jerusalem amongst the Jesus followers. And those in Jerusalem, by the way, they were losing their businesses, they were losing family members, they were losing any kind of uh, social standing, they were being rejected, they were being marginalized, they were being overlooked. And these Macedonians heard about them and begged to give an offering to the believers in Jerusalem. Now, I want to read this to you in the ESV because there is a verse in here I don't think I've ever quite seen it before. You ever read, you know, portions of Scripture, but you've never seen it before? Like, I read it before, but I've never seen it before. It's a difference. I'm just telling you. I don't know why it's a difference. It's a difference. Like, you'll just be reading it, and then you'll see it. And, I, and I, I've seen this like I've never seen it before. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Listen to this in the ESV. This is about the churches in Macedonia. Listen, it says, for in severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Okay, you can see it. You can see it. Look at this verse. Let this sink in for a second. This is about real people like you and me. Let's read it again. In severe test of affliction, comma, the next part after the comma should be they were greatly distressed and broken up about it. But it says in the severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, it gets worse, and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity. Who are these people? I mean, they sound like they're like, I don't know, like Oompa Loompas from a place that's not real. Right? I mean, what is this? Is this fiction? What is this, a cartoon? Nobody acts like this. Notice the language. The Bible cannot exaggerate. That would be error. Severe test of affliction, abundance of joy, extreme poverty, wealth of generosity. Who are these people? Do you ever take a verse like this and like kind of put it side by side and ask yourself, how much of this verse is realized in my life? How do I line up? I mean, I went to the dentist this week. You want to talk about severe affliction. <laughs> I got sedated before I went in. True story. I get in. They put on the gas mask. Are you okay? I'm like, no, I, we got to turn up the nitrous here. I'm still, I'm still awake, right? Like, I, I can't even... I got an IV in this arm this week, an IV in this arm this week, trying to prepare to preach to you. You know, I want to be there for you. And I mean, I'm like, oh, it burns. Oh, I'm not going to look, right? Like, I mean, give me an IV and a dentist visit. And I mean, I'm telling you, like, I am looking for people to stand in the gap for me, to pray, you know, like, and I'll tell you all of my pain. Like, I want you to, I want you to feel it with me. These people... Their severe test of affliction leads them to an abundance of joy, which leads to extreme poverty, 
which causes them to overflow in a wealth of generosity. I read that verse and I'm like, whatever happened to these Macedonians needs to happen to me. What kind of churches, and it wasn't just one church, it was like three churches and a bunch of other little churches out in the country. They all were just like, man, our time's tough. Yeah, but woo I love Jesus. I mean, some of you, if we don't get a parking spot during the Christmas season, we wonder if there's a God. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like we come back to pick up the sweater we had on hold, and the salesperson's like, we sold it. You're like, you sold it? That was under my name. <laughs> right? Like, a little bit of perspective here. These people are losing their job, losing their companies, losing any source of income, actual family members, this extreme. Just, just keep it up there for a second, Casey, because it's just really convicting. A severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy, extreme poverty, overflow and wealth of generosity. Look, look, at, look at what verse 4 says. Can we put verse 4 up there in the ESV? And it says, it says, begging earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. What? So this group of people were like, please, Paul, we don't have any money, but let us give some. What? They're begging. They're begging. No one was rolling into town going, hey, guys, let's be generous. And everyone's like, oh, okay, see what I got. All right, all right, all right here. All right, can we get off the subject now? No, they're, Paul, 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 please, 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 please. And Paul's like, are you guys sure? Like, you don't really have any money. Please, please let us give to the believers in Jerusalem. Like, is it okay for me to dream as a community facilitator and leader and pastor? Is it okay for me to dream about a community that looks like the Macedonians? You know, the kind of community that doesn't need, like, three really, really disturbing videos where we all watch and we go, oh, gosh, it is really bad there. Do you feel bad? I feel bad. Let's give something. Tis the season. You know, and, and like if it, if it doesn't move us enough, we like show another video. Like, all right, there's, you, you need one more. One more video. Play it. And there's all these sad scenes of people and you're like, oh, okay, I feel horrible. Is it okay to dream about being a part of a community that grows in generosity? That we actually beg. <coughs> Come on, Dayquil and Jesus. <laughs> beg to be a part of giving resources and giving our time. Why? Because it's an honor and it's a privilege and it's a favor. We are blessed to be a blessing. I'd like to give you three observations from this passage, three observations about the Macedonians that I think will help us understand what giving is and what generosity. We call it the, the other giving. It says in verse, verse three, it says, they gave according to their means, as I could testify, ESV says, and beyond their means. They gave according to their means, the Macedonians, and beyond. Remember what the Message Bible says? It says they gave what they could afford. In fact, Paul says they gave way more than they could afford. Giving or generosity is not based on what I can afford. That's my first point. I got three points. It's my Christmas gift to you. Concrete sequentials, enjoy. Three points. Can you imagine? Try to take notes to some of my sermons. I know, it's a nightmare. It's like, where are we in this forest of communication? Okay, but here's, here's three points. Be blessed. Generosity, giving, is not based on what I can afford. No, it says they gave beyond what they can afford. Now, if you grew up in church, like in the 80s, some of us would swipe our credit card and go into debt to give. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Some of you don't. Okay, that's great. Okay, then we will pretend like we don't know that. Okay, but there was a time where people would be like, swipe the card, I'm just going to go into debt and believe the Lord. I'm not suggesting that, but what I am suggesting is the attitude of the Macedonians, which was basically the original language means they determined what was comfortable or doable, and they said, and then we're going to give this. They determined like, we could do this, 
but we're going to do this. That was their attitude. Generosity and giving is not based on what you can afford. Affordability? Affordability and generosity do not even live in the same cul-de-sac. They're not even cousins, man. They're not even... Generosity is not consulting affordability. Affordability has its place. Affordability on, in my life is like a rookie on a team. That's the role affordability plays. And a rookie on a team should be happy to be there. And a rookie on a team shouldn't be the guy giving the speech right before we run out of the locker room to play the game. No, the rookies are like, listen to the guys who've been here. They're going to give the motivational speech. And, and rookie, if we want you to talk, we'll ask. But until then, just smile and be glad to be in the locker room. Right? Affordability? You're a rookie. You, hey, you get to be on my team. You should be grateful that I even consult you. And if I need your advice, I'll ask. But you don't lead my life. You don't lead my finances. No, faith leads the flow of my finances. Affordability, you have your place. I'm so grateful for you. We're glad that you're here. But you're not supposed to talk right now. Because we over here talking about generosity. We're over here talking about being generous and being faith-filled and give. And sometimes affordability, you are a wet blanket. I am, yes. But I love you. You're on the team. I love you. You have your place. But don't be a wet blanket. We are believing God. Now, anytime we start talking about money, people think it's about money. It's actually not. The Bible connects money to your heart, or more specifically, to your faith. And what does God want more than anything on earth? Faith, trust. He, the Bible says he looks across the landscape of the earth and he looks for people who have faith. And so when it comes to your finances, you apply the same faith that you said, Jesus, I trust you to forgive me of my sins and make me righteous and eternally put me in your family. You use that same faith to say, Lord, and I trust you when it comes to my bills and cash and checkings and savings. Affordability, you have your place. It is not a big place because generosity goes beyond affordability. I think, again, I think I'm not, I'm not mad at affordability, but I have learned over the years God is supernatural and he, were, he will work miracles. And it is just fun to give beyond what you deem comfortable and doable. It's okay. This is, this is our line. We're going here. All right, that's why with Chelsea and I, when we pray about giving to something, we always go with the larger number. That's always God. Right? Satan's never going to be like, give more to God. <laughs> okay. You know. No, no. It's a, it, so we always, okay, whatever. All right. We're giving, we're giving more. Because generosity is not, people will say, well, I, I can't really afford to give. I can't really afford to tithe. Or I can't really afford to, like, I, 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 that, it never occurred to me that we were consulting affordability in relationship to Generosity. Generosity is a spirit and a heart. Whether you have a little or a lot, it, that attitude remains the same. I would argue, could the Macedonians afford to give to the believers in Jerusalem? Absolutely not. Paul even says it. He says, that, I didn't ask them. It was their own idea. I wouldn't dare. They're broken. They're broke. They're bankrupt. Are you kidding me? But they begged me. So I said, okay, and they gave. Am I going through puberty up here? And they gave. <laughs> it's going on. <laughs> oh, my word. Tell you what, this podcast is going to be a blessing. So <laughs> giving and generosity, it's not based on affordability. It's, it's based on faith. It's based on conviction. We know who our God is. Second point, it says this about, it says in verse 5, in this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. They gave themselves first to the Lord. Can I read that in the message, Casey, in the message Bible? I think it's verse 5 or 6. 
It was totally spontaneously, and, and spontaneous, entirely their own idea, and it caught us completely off guard. What explains it? Okay, this, I love this. This is the punchline. What explains it? Okay, so a minute ago we read that verse, verse 2, ESV, and you're like, how is that possible? Who are these people? Why would they do that? How does that happen to me? I struggle giving just a little bit. I struggle, like, caring for people, and I get mad in traffic, and I, I am the person that, like, cussed someone out because they took my parking spot, and, like, I, I'm so far from 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2. Well, here's what explains it. Oh, here's why they did it. Here's what had happened. What explains it was they had first given themselves unreservedly to God. What explains it is they first given themselves unreservedly to God. They acted like this. They gave like this. They lived like this. They think like this. They see like this because they had first given themselves unreservedly to God. And look at what the next verse says. So the other giving... Ooh, I love that. Oh, are you, are, you, are you talking about money? That's the other giving. You're talking about giving time? That's the other giving. That's the secondary giving. It's important, but that's the other giving. Because the first offering, the first generosity, the first giving, the primary giving is when we offer our lives a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is my, which is my reasonable service. It only makes sense in light of what Jesus has done. So what explains it is people who live like this, give like this, think like this, see like this, have given themselves, unreserved, not reserving one aspect of their life from God. Recently, a friend of mine said, well, Judah, that's my thing. We all got our thing. I said, well, what? He said, it's my thing. Come on, everybody has a thing. But yeah, but that's, I don't think we're supposed to live, yeah, but it's my thing. I was like, when did we have, when did that come into the equation? Come on, everybody's allowed to have a thing, you know, kind of a thing. It's like, God, I gave you everything. It's 99%. It's practically 100. But this is my thing. I kind of, this, this is on my terms. I get to do what I want in this area. Who are you robbing, God? Oh, you robbing yourself. When you give yourself unreserved, God, you can inspect every space of my life. It's not perfect. You already know that. I have to tell you that. But it's yours. You got this jar of clay. It's yours. I'm, I'm broken like Humpty Dumpty, but I'm yours. I gave you everything. I mean, there are some dark corners down here, but it's yours. And that you give yourself unreservedly to God. It says, and the other giving, I love this, simply flows. That's the kind of church I dream of. The other giving just flows. It just simply flows. People are like, why are you so generous? We're like, huh, what? Why are you so generous? I, I, uh, it's basic to me. It's reasonable service. It's um, Jesus. He gave me everything. I, I, I wouldn't have life. I wouldn't have breath. I wouldn't exist. I wouldn't have skin. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't have lips, hips, fingertips. I, I wouldn't have any. I, so I, uh, uh, it's hard to explain, I guess. I just, it's just, it's not even an option for me. It just simply flows everywhere I go. It's just, I, I, think, I think generous. I see generous. I see opportunity. I see need as an opportunity. I see, it's just, it's, 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 it's what we do. I wonder if one of the great testimonies to the world, to the world, who do not yet know the forgiveness of Jesus. I wonder, I'm just wondering out loud now. I'm just wondering out loud on game day. I'm wondering out loud. I wonder if part of our greatest story and testament to the world will be what we do with our money. I wonder if the world will start to go, man, you got millions of people just walking around, hooking people up, just blessing people. What is wrong with you guys? It's, it's what Jesus has done. He just, there's nothing like running to somebody who is just, just truly generous from the core of their being. You're like, I don't know what it is, but I need to be your friend. I mean, what generous person have you been like, oh gosh, here he comes again. Here she comes again. Oh, such a drag. Why? So kind, so considerate, so generous, so giving. Prepare yourself. <laughs> oh, it's the exact opposite. And I wonder if that's part of God's plan for us as Jesus followers. That this other giving would simply flow. Other giving would simply flow. There's a story of a missionary 
on a Native American reservation years ago. In fact, the Mississippi Mass Choir in 1991 recorded a song called The Indian. And I remember listening to it when I was 16 years old. And what's so compelling about the story is how this Native American man took Jesus at face value, took his story literally. The story goes, the missionary was in front of this old tent on this reservation. He was telling the story to become clear to him that there were men and women and boys and girls under the tent who had, in fact, never heard the story of Jesus, had never even heard his story. And so the preacher started in on the story and said, Jesus came to the earth not to condemn the world but to save the world. He was blessing children and healing those who were blind and deaf, and he was caring for the prostitute and the overlooked and and this Native American man in the back of the room, he was so moved by the words. The beginning of the story, he, he ran out of the tent and he grabbed some of his belongings and things and he ran down the middle of the aisle right in the opening section of the missionary sermon and he, he laid his headdress and beads and gifts and he laid them in the altar and the missionary was a bit startled and he said, he said well, Jesus Christ, give something to me. I, I want to give something to Jesus Christ. And the missionary said, well, th thank you, sir. And he walked back to the back of the room and sat down. And the missionary kept on telling the story and he said, well, Jesus actually, he left his home in glory and in heaven and he became a man and, and he put on skin and bone and he moved into the neighborhood and it's, it's like a man becoming an ant. I mean, he took the lowly posture of putting on skin and bone, God incarnate, God in the flesh. And once again, the Native American man ran out of the tent and he came back in, he had his, teepee and all of his belongings, as much as he could carry, and he walked down the middle aisle and he, he laid it on the headdress and the beads, and missionary is again startled. He says, he says Jesus give so much, even his home. I, I, I want to give my home to Jesus Christ. Missionary said, okay, okay, and he wasn't done with the story. I hadn't even got to the punchline. He said, Jesus didn't come to live, he came to die. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And he, he talked about how Jesus was hanging on the cross for some six hours and he was, he was flanked on the right and the left by criminals. And one criminal was not interested, but the other said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turned and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And the preacher goes on to say that like that man, any of us who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved and will spend eternity in paradise with Jesus for only Jesus forgives and only Jesus saves. At the back of the room, the Native American man could not contain himself. His tears flowed down his face like a waterfall and he came running down the middle aisle. No one had moved except this man. He came running down the middle aisle and he, and he jumped and leaped on all of his possessions and he laid there. The missionary said, sir. And he said, no. He said, Jesus Christ gave everything, even himself for me. I give everything, even myself for Jesus Christ. And you look at that story and you're like, have we forgotten to take Jesus literally? Have we forgotten that Actually, the response of this man is only reasonable. It's only reasonable. No, no generosity, it, it, it starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with me giving me. Me saying, God, you have, you have everything. And then you insert words like tithe. Ooh, what's that mean? 10%, 10%, 10%. 10%. We in here talking about 10%. I feel like Allen Iverson. We're talking about practice? We're talking about practice? We're, we're, we're splitting hairs about 10%? I want to be the Native American man on my everything. Say, God, what? what? I'm going to die soon. Life's a vapor. You got everything. What do you want? What am I going to do? I paid my bills. I'm blessed. What am I going to do? I, I, the best thing I can do is give everything I have to you. You've given me everything. And lastly, and I'm done, ahead of schedule, kind of. It says in verse 12, I'm just encouraging myself this morning. And by the way, if you can't tell, it just feels good. And it's not even the day quill. I'm pretty sure it's Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8, 12, for if the readiness is there, 
It is acceptable when giving according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. Which is to say, giving starts today, not when I earn or save more. Generosity starts now. Not based on what you don't have. Now, once I get, then I'm going to be generous. That's not how it works. The Macedonians proved that theory wrong. You don't sit around going, now once I earn more, once I save more, <coughs> excuse me, then I'm going to be generous. But generosity is not based on a number. It's not based on a figure. It's based on forgiveness. It's based on Jesus. And... And that was the story of manna. That was the message of manna. Maybe you've heard of manna. It's the frosted flakes that Jesus fed the Israelites for 40 years with. It was their breakfast every morning for 40 years. And that is exactly what's being referenced in the last verse we read. I believe it's verse 12 or verse 15. Whoever, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. Whoever gathered little had no lack. That's a reference to Exodus 16 in the Israelites. And here was the story. We've talked about this last week. The story was every morning, can you imagine? Every morning, over a million people in tents would zip open their tent. They, I don't think they had zippers, so that's, that's complete heresy. But they unstrapped their tents. Like, Judah, just move on. We don't know exactly what it was. Got it. They came outside of their tent every morning. Over a million people. It's funny, we talk about walking down and getting the paper. Hey, hey, Joe, how you doing, man? You good? All right, all right. Hey, have a good morning. All right, all right, all right. God bless. Over a million people every morning came out of their tents. You want to see how passionate God is about you trusting him for your sustenance and your resource and your finance? For 40 years like clockwork, he said, I'm going to make my children over a million strong. I'm going to serve them breakfast and dinner every day. And his only stipulation was, you only gather, earn, save what you can eat. Now, if you think this is a reference that God doesn't like saving or gathering or retirement, it's not. Because years before, Joseph actually resourced God's people by saving. So God's not against saving, he's for faith. That's all. It's just, it's a, it's a message of faith. This is not anti-saving. It's pro-faith. But every morning he said, now you all come out, and as much as you can eat, that's what you gather. Now if you gather more than you'll eat and you try to save it up, it'll grow worms, and sure enough it did. Because every morning, God wanted his kids to walk out and go, hey, how are you? It, it's here again. Okay, think, think about this. Over a million people every morning. How are you? Good, yeah. Oh, man, good to see you too. It's good, right? Tastes like honey, yeah. All right, see you soon. Every morning, give it to your kids. Dad, where'd this come from? Well, it's, it's, it's like the grass, it, it's on it. Um, it's like dew and then it just appears. From where? Uh, from God, kids. God just feeds us? Yeah. Where does it come from? Uh, it comes from God. Yeah, but when, when was God born? It turns into Bible answer, man. He, 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 he is never born. He's always been. Just eat your frosted flakes. <laughs> 40 years. Isn't it interesting? And I'm going to prophesy to somebody in here. For 40 years, God wanted to teach his children about trust. Their financial status would change dramatically in the promised land. But before their financial status changed, God wanted to establish their faith status. And I'm telling you, I'm talking to somebody in here this morning, I really am. God is about to take you in to a land that has been promised. And some of you, it's a land that has been promised to your father or to your mother or to your grandfather. But God is going to take you in. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's about to take you into a promised land. And you have been wondering why he has been requiring so much faith and so much trust. You are busy eating frosted flakes, but your time is coming. God is going to do something supernatural in this land of promise. You can sense it. You can feel it. It's near. But do not despise the day of small beginnings. 
things. For God has been teaching you and training you and preparing you for what is just ahead. And so you go ahead and open up the flap of that tent and you pick up that manna one more time and you eat that quail another day and you recall and you rehearse and you remember how faithful your God is. For the day is coming soon. You will walk into a land that was promised to your forefathers and it's there. It'll be a land of plenty. It'll be a land flowing with milk and honey. But in that land, you will remember these days and you will declare it is the same God who supplied for me in the wilderness. It's the God who supplies for me in the land of promise. All of it culminates in faith. It's faith. It's faith. So generosity starts now. Not when I'm there, but when I'm here. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God every day. Where is this coming from, God? It's coming from God. It's coming from God. You know, you know it's amazing. I promise I got I to stop. I'm just so excited. Paul says, Paul says he says, I, I, I didn't want the Macedonians to give and then have nothing. So now Jerusalem's taken care of, the Jerusalem believers, and there and he says, I want there to be, I want there to be, I want there to be something like the redwood trees. You know those big old redwood trees you can drive trucks through? You know those, like the biggest tree in the whole wide world? Do you know how shallow their roots are? You know how they get so big? Because all the trees in the forest connect roots. And before you know it, you got the biggest trees in the world. You have the most impressive forest on the face of the planet. You know what God wants us to do when it comes to our resource? It's just the connection of faith. He wants us to give one to another. And like the book of Acts, the early church, you could not find one person who couldn't pay their bills. You could Not everybody was driving Bentleys, don't get me wrong, but everyone was cared for, everyone was provided for. God is trying to work a miracle amongst us. He did it in his, in his children Israel, and he wants to do it today in this church. And if we will all give, and if we will all lean in, there will be an interconnection of our roots, and there will be a growth, and there will be a st- Establishment, and we will stand back and say, look what the Lord has done. It is not the big giving of a few. It is the sacrifice of everyone. It is the sacrifice of average, ordinary people saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give. I'm going to believe that you're going to do great things through my life. And God is going to interconnect our lives. And the growth is going to be astounding. He said, no, I don't want you to give, and then you have nothing. Somebody, No, no, as you give, it's called the divine economy. Supernaturally, God is going to supply. I, I'm telling you, I am persuaded this morning that God wants to use church home in an astounding way as a testimony to a good father who supplies for his children. I feel provoked this morning. God wants to do something significant through this church, and part of our story Just part, not the only part, but a considerable part will be how God provides for this house. It's going to be supernatural. And we are going to be a blessing to so many churches and so many people. We've given tens of millions. We're going to give hundreds of millions, and we're going to give billions. i got 24 more years before I move to Palm Springs. You can see me there. But until then, we are literally, I am believing, to give billions. Listen, away, away so that the world will know there is a Father in heaven who loves his children and he takes care of them. So as he did for Israel, as he did for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will do for you and he will do for me. And what he can get through us, he will get to us so that we can be a blessing to the nations of the world. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I thank you so much for what you're saying to our church God, we sense your presence in this building. We sense your presence in this room. And, oh, God, we want to honor you with our days. We want to honor you with our life. We trust you, oh, God. We trust you, oh, God. And we want to trust you in the simplest, most practical way, even with our paychecks, our checkings account, our savings account. We want to trust you. Teach us again, oh, Lord to trust you like our ancestors trusted you, like Abraham trusted you. If you need to get us out of our tent again, do it. Help us count the stars. Help us rehearse your magnitude and your magnificence and your glory and your goodness. We love you, Jesus. 
If you're here this morning, you say, Judah, I want to follow Jesus. I want to accept Jesus, the forgiveness that only Jesus offers. I want to pray for you this morning. You know who you are. God loves you so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You know who you are. If that's you on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to lift up your hand and put it right back down. And I say this nearly every Sunday. I, I ask you to respond externally because I believe what's happening to you internally is real. And when you see and feel your hand go up, it becomes even more real to you. So on the count of three, you say, Judah, I, I want to follow Jesus. I, I want to accept Jesus and the forgiveness that he offers. I want my eternity secure in him. On the count of three, you lift up your hand, put it right back down. One, two, three. If that's you, just lift up your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Anybody else, you slip it up, put it right back down. Jesus, thank you. You put us on this earth to tell your story, to tell your story, and that's what we're going to do. And I thank you again today. Your story of forgiveness and grace and mercy has touched individuals in the deepest part of their soul. And they have now given their lives to you. We thank you that forgiveness flows freely in this house. We are forgiven. And whom Jesus sets free is free indeed. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I declare over church home, we are going to be a house of generosity. We're going to be a house of giving. We're going to stand up and be counted in these days of anxiety and fear and worry and greed. We are going to overcome greed. We're going to overcome fear and anxiety with generosity and with giving. We're going to be generous with our finances, generous with our words, generous with our time generous with our energy. Father, generous to the core. For you alone are the most generous being in the universe. And we worship you and we love you and we anticipate the generous days ahead and all that we get to partner with you in doing. Bless this house. Extend the borders of this house. Allow us to tell more people about your grace and your goodness. Lord, your will be done. Your kingdom come. Wherever you want us to go, we'll go. We trust you. We're following you. The steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And we say yes and amen to all your plans and all your ways in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you believe that, would you say amen? Come on, let's stand to our feet and let's sing out what we believe about our God. Come on, church. All right, was your life changed watching our YouTube channel? We super hope so. Was your life changed? Yep. Promise? Yep. So if you want more content from our YouTube channel, what do you do? You subscribe. And then what else? You. Recent messages right, there. <laughs> right here. And if there's a boy out there, any boys anywhere, we're not interested in you for 40 years. 40 years. Okay. Love you.